If you have ever wondered how a nine to five professional is able to manage one, two, three, four, five Airbnbs, then this video is for you because today I'm gonna to be breaking down the team that you need to hire to help make Airbnb as passive as possible. Now, I call this team my Airbnb Avengers because they all have a very specific role that is critical to making my Airbnb portfolio as passive as possible. Now notice, I said as passive as possible. I did not say passive because at the end of the day, you still have to manage your Airbnb Avengers just like you still have to manage guests. But with the correct team in place, you can take the management of just one property from 10 to 15 hours a week to one to five. And by the way, if you don't know who I am, I'm Rob Abasolo, the founder and CEO of HostCamp.com, the number one resource for all things short-term rentals on the internet. I've got a community of 3,000 thriving hosts. That is hard to say, by the way. And I'm one of the largest, if not the largest creators of free short-term rental education in the world. Let's get into today's video. So let's break down the hires that every Airbnb host will need, in my opinion, without exception, when you're first getting started. Your cleaner, your handyman, your pest control crew, your landscaper, your sexy pool guy, slash your hot tub tech, and your photographer. What I wanna do today is break down every single role, what I've paid in the past, and a few key considerations that you're gonna wanna keep in mind for every single one of these. And by the way, if you're a visual learner and you want a nice little beautiful PDF, I've gone ahead and made that for you. It's free for you to download. I'll leave the link in the description down below. Let's get started with our cleaner. Key considerations for your cleaners, let's talk about how often you're gonna need them first. So this one is gonna be a pretty critical role. I always say that cleaners are the eyes and ears of your operation. They are your boots on the ground if you ever hear me say that on the channel. This is gonna be the most important hire you make because an amazing cleaner will get you five star reviews time and time and time again. And an okay to good cleaner will get you mostly five star reviews with some four star reviews. So I know that doesn't seem like a big difference, but keep in mind that the SEO, search engine optimization on Airbnb, meaning where you're listing places and the results really can be driven by your five-star reviews amongst a few other things. So you wanna put a lot of time into interviewing your cleaners, vetting them, and really finding someone that you feel can take care of your home as if it were their own. Now, when I say every turn, in case you're not familiar with that specific verbiage, a turn is whenever you get your Airbnb ready for the next guest. So guest checks out, your cleaner comes and turns it, cleans it, gets it ready, gets it stocked, and then boom, it's ready for the next Airbnb guest. So for me, I typically host five to seven stays every single month. So your cleaner in that instance would be coming to clean between five to seven times every single month, sometimes more. I have other listings where my cleaners come to clean 10 to 15 times a month and I deal with them a lot and I have a rapport and a relationship with them because they really are the ones quarterbacking my Airbnb. Other key consideration is you want them available for emergencies if possible. So this to me is what I consider knocking out two birds with one stone. So when I say emergencies, there will be times in your Airbnb business if you haven't systematized it and built out the processes and all that good stuff where something goes wrong at your property. Let's say the light bulb goes out, let's say that the batteries die and you don't have backup batteries, let's say that you're out of toilet paper and you just had tie the night before. Well, in these instances, you need someone to come and remedy that situation. And if you're like me and live in Houston, Texas, but you have a property in the Smoky Mountains, then you kind of want your cleaners available to come and do some of those tasks for you for an additional fee. That to me will save me the headache of having to hire a handyman who would charge me a hundred bucks to go buy batteries and then swap them out of my remote. A cleaner might only charge me 20 bucks because that's more equivalent to their hourly rate. So if you can get your cleaner on board with being able to do some of these emergency tasks, that is a huge bonus and a huge time saver whenever you need it. With all that said, my personal Airbnb portfolio is pretty systematized and processed out. So we really don't ever have cleaners coming by all that often, but they're down to do it. And really the only times that a cleaner comes out in between stays is if they didn't do a great job cleaning and a guest complains about, you know, a dirty clump of hair in the corner or something like that. Doesn't happen all the time, but at my level, it happens occasionally. Third thing here, this to me, is the thing that will separate an Airbnb cleaner from just a typical cleaner and it is guaranteed availability. So when you hire a cleaner to come clean your house, for example, for personal reasons, they're gonna kind of squeeze you in around their schedule. They're gonna wait till you're on their route and then they will tell you what day they can come by and they might say, hey, I'm busy on Tuesday, but can I come on Friday? And you might say, yeah, sure, that's not a big deal because the stakes are low there, right? But with Airbnb, if a guest is checking out on Monday morning and then we have a new guest checking in Monday afternoon, we need someone to clean without exception. So that's why you really need need to make sure that you work out guaranteed availability whenever you're talking to your cleaner and you can get their word that they will prioritize your clean and they have a team big enough to guarantee they can clean your spaces whenever you need them cleaned. What I see a lot of hosts doing is they'll just hire someone with no Airbnb experience. Maybe that cleaner might come one or two times and then all of a sudden on that third time, hey, I'm really sorry, I got another job today. The Airbnb host doesn't have a backup and then they're screwed, right? That is the last thing that you want because that means that you're gonna be cleaning your own Airbnb if you live in the area 
or you're gonna have to pay a ton of money to get another random cleaner in there last second. And you don't want that. So you wanna make sure that you have guaranteed availability. For the most part, across my entire portfolio, I am good to go here. However, I do have a backup. Most every single property in my portfolio has a backup cleaner in case someone gets sick, in case someone wants to take a vacation. Off the top of my head, out of 45 doors, I have three cleaners that don't have backups, but it's because they have an entire team that can fill in for each other, so it's not as big of a problem. But it's not a bad idea to have another cleaner on call. As a matter of fact, I have a situation right now at one of my properties, and this is really just good practice to have a backup cleaner because it'll get you out of a pinch like I'm in right now, where I had a cleaner that I was paying $30 an hour for years. Everything was really great, and then she texted us out of the blue and said, hey, I'm raising my prices to $50 an hour, which is a 60% increase in their rate, which we love that cleaner, but it doesn't really make sense for our business. We can't afford that. Thankfully, we have a backup cleaner that we know and trust that we can slot in as our full-time cleaner. And then the last thing on this one went a little longer than I thought, but this is the most important job in my opinion, is you wanna make sure that they're down for a 1099. You have to 1099 your cleaners, your vendors, your contractors. If you pay them more than $600 a year, you have to 1099 them. This is just the way the world works. Uncle Sam wants his money. And you might find that cleaners are very resistant to getting a 1099 because that means that they then have to pay taxes on the money that you pay them. The problem if you don't give them a 1099 is you can't report that you paid a cleaner, meaning that you can't write off that expense, meaning that you're gonna pay more in taxes. You wanna have that conversation as early as possible in the interview phase, because if you try to do that one or two years in, guess what, it's not gonna happen. They're gonna either quit or they're gonna make you pay them a lot more because it was not agreed upon beforehand. And that is basically your cleaners in a nutshell. This is the number one Airbnb Avenger here. Like I said, put all of your time into getting the best dang cleaner. There's one more thing I wanna say about this. Don't negotiate them. Whatever price they tell you, you want to pay it. So if a cleaner says, hey, I wanna charge you $200 per clean, either take that amount and run with it and pay them that or hire someone else if it's too expensive. If you go to this cleaner and you say, hey, you said 200 bucks, how about 160? And then if they're like, no, that's too low, we can't do that. And then you're like, all right, all right, how about 175? They may reluctantly take the 175 because maybe they need the money now. But what's gonna happen is they're gonna care less about your job. They're gonna nickel and dime you every single time you ask them for little favors, like these emergencies that you might have them come out, or they'll just nickel and dime you for little things that they do during their clean. So let's say that they find a light bulb that needs to be replaced during their clean. They'll replace it for you, but they might charge you 15 bucks. And then you will be really annoyed by that because you know how much effort goes into changing light bulb and you're gonna say, well, why the heck are they charging me $15? That took them two seconds. That wouldn't have happened if you just paid your cleaners what they're worth. Cool, pay them what they're worth. I promise it is worth it. This is not the one that you wanna negotiate. You do not wanna get off on the wrong foot with your cleaner. I had this happen at my Austin property when I launched it and she lasted about two, three weeks. It was traumatic. Just pay them what they're worth, okay? Next one. Airbnb Avenger number two, or dose, as my people would say. You're a handyman. Handyman is super important because for the most part, they will actually be the ones that are fixing anything that goes wrong. So the ideal standard operating procedure, or SOP for short, is your cleaner will come in, they'll clean, they'll find anything that needs repair, something that might be broken, maybe it's a loose piece of furniture, they will text you and they will say, hey Rob, I noticed that your patio furniture is super wobbly. If a guest sits down on it, it's gonna break. You get that text, you call your handyman, you say, hey Bob, my patio table's super wobbly, can you come fix it? He says, yeah, sounds great, let me come fix it for you. That's my impression of Beetlejuice was a handyman. You bunch of losers! There are just certain things that a handyman is gonna be able to do that is outside of the skill set of a typical cleaner. The perfect world is you never talk to your handyman or your handywoman. Thank you! You never wanna have to deal with them. It's always bad news if you call your handyman. But what that means is your handyman is not gonna be someone that you utilize super often. They're gonna be on an as-needed basis. You may deal with your handyman once or twice every single month. Second thing you wanna keep in mind is you do need a backup for your handyman. I love my handyman, but they are not always the most punctual. They're not always the most organized, reliable. They don't always show up when they say they're gonna show up. I swear, I do love them. But for the most part, here's the deal. Typically, handymen are good old boys that are really good at fixing things, but they're not business people because they're not business people, they kind of answer the phone and say, yeah, I'm gonna do it, I'll be right there. And then they get caught up on a job that ends up taking them 10 more hours and then you find out that they never actually showed up and then it just becomes this whole problem. So it's not a bad idea to have two handymen, maybe even three. We always have backups because there are some properties of mine where I have a new handyman for every single job, like in the Smoky Mountains. In some markets, you can just never rely on one handyman every single time. So understand you will need backups. The more of these you can have, the better. 
If you can have a first-hand recommendation, even better. I will say, once you find that handyman and you take care of them and you pay them quickly, they will prioritize you. I've got an awesome handyman in Crystal Beach. He's awesome. He's so great. He's there as soon as I ask him. He goes over and beyond. He sends me a request to pay him on Facebook. I do it instantly. And I think because he knows that I'm a trustworthy client, he's willing to put his neck out for me. Last thing here is I'm gonna say is you want your handyman to be versatile. This is super, super important because it does take a little bit of critical thinking to kind of address certain things that might happen at your Airbnb. Sometimes it might be a plumbing thing, but it's too small of a job to hire a plumber and it's too big of a job to ask your cleaner to do it. You need a handyman that can come and do very basic plumbing, super basic electrical. When I say basic electrical, I mean swapping out a sconce or a light fixture, maybe changing out an electrical outlet, maybe being able to flip a breaker, things like that. I'm not asking them to rewire a house. I'm not asking them to swap a breaker in the panel. You definitely want a pro for that type of job. But when it comes to a handyman, you kind of need someone that can change out a toilet hose from a plumbing standpoint. Whatever it is, ideally you have someone that can kind of do it all. So you don't have to hire five different people to do all the different functions of your property. From a pricing standpoint, that's going to depend. The more legitimate the handyman and the more organized they are, the more expensive they're going to be. A really great handyman that I have found in the Smoky Mountains charges me an $80 trip fee. So just to go out, no matter what, he's charging me 80 bucks plus his hourly rate of $50 an hour. So no matter what, anytime I have a handyman at that property, I'm paying $130 minimum. Typically it's going to be 150 to 200 bucks, you know, depending on if it takes a couple of hours and that's really, really expensive. My favorite arrangement is the one that I have with my Crystal Beach guy who will go and do a really small task and charge me like 10, 15 bucks. I just had that guy go out to my property yesterday and put bolts in my toilet seat so the toilet seat doesn't wiggle off. He went to the store and bought them, swapped them out and I said, how much do I owe you? He said, nah, I don't know, 20 bucks. And I was like, boom, 20 bucks it is my man. But that same job would have cost me $130 in the Smoky Mountains, right? If you find that loyal, unorganized worker, there's some pros and cons. Pros, they're cheap, reliable, they are loyal. Cons, they're not gonna be super organized and punctual. You will have some pretty differing personality types in your handyman category here. Just make sure that you're interviewing and vetting them correctly and you have a good recommendation from someone else if possible. Number three, if you hate cockroaches, you are going to want to hire a pest control company. These are the Avengers that are gonna come out and make sure that you don't have any bugs, insects, pests, rodents, anything like that. One roach can cost you hundreds if not thousands of dollars in a refund. Roaches suck, they're pretty gross, and if a guest sees a roach at your property, I'm gonna tell you it's really hard to recover from that even if you did everything right. But here's the truth with roaches and mice, they're attracted to things like water and food, all of which are in your Airbnb. You gotta keep in mind your guests, they're not throwing stuff away in the trash can all the time. They're not really treating your house like they treat their own house. They're just kind of tossing and leaving crumbs everywhere. And for that reason, you kind of want your pest control company to come out every one to two weeks. Now, for the most part, I would say it is standard for your pest control to come every two weeks, maybe every single month. You don't really want that with an Airbnb because of the amount of guests and food and dirtiness and grossness with those guests coming in so many times every single month. Remember, I said I host five to seven groups of people every single month. If there is an average of four people per group, we are looking at 20 to 28 people in your house eating, pooping, burping, leaving crumbs, tracking in their nasty foot juices, spilling liquids and Cokes on the floor, throwing candy bar wrappers in the backyard, all that stuff. They're doing that at all times at your Airbnb. I know I'm really selling the Airbnb dream here right now, but with that said, if you can get your pest control company to come every single week, we'll keep your house maintained from a pest standpoint. Second thing you wanna keep in mind here is can they do all pests? Meaning, do they only come and spray for insects or will they lay out rat traps and mouse traps when there is an issue? Most of the time the answer is yes, but then you get into some very niche things like can they help with rodents that are under your house that get inside of your fascia board. This is something that happened at my LA property. I had openings in my house and I had like a couple of rats get in. As a result, they went up to my attic, all that stuff, right? Problem is my pest control company wouldn't come and remedy that. It was outside of their wheelhouse. That's when you start getting into the handiwork. Great thing though, is that my pest control guy that comes and sprays happens to be a handyman. He goes, hey, if you want, you know, after I wrap up my route, I could come back and do all that for you for 150 bucks. So I was able to take care of it in that instance as a fluke. But if you could have a pest control company that sort of does everything, then it's just gonna save you from having to call around when that moment comes. And then lastly, you might have things like bats. Your pest control company may not handle bats, but one interesting thing that happened is I had a nest of baby birds in my chimney and they were flapping around in there kind of loud within the house. My pest control company wouldn't come and do it. That to me falls within that world, but they were like, ah, we don't want to do it. That's not our wheelhouse. So that basically just adds to the workload. And then the very last thing that you want to keep in mind here is this particular job will require some coordination. Now you will need to coordinate with your cleaners as well, but eventually once you start getting into softwares and systems and property management, management softwares and all that good stuff, you can automate a lot of the coordination with your cleaners. But with your pest control people, you know, there isn't really a property management system that I know of, I could be very wrong here, that coordinates with your pest control company. Typically, all of my 
pest control companies are texting me, hey, we're coming out today. Does that still work for your schedule? Then we gotta go and check our calendar, make sure that there isn't a guest there and say, yep. And if there is a guest there, say, oh, sorry, there is a guest there today. How about in two days? And then they say, great, we'll come out in two days. And then I get a last second booking and then that gets booked and then I gotta cancel all the pest control companies. That's like a whole thing. And the reason I just say this is you don't really want your pest control people coming in spring. You know, they have to go around the side of the house. They might be walking past windows. You don't want your guests to ever feel creeped out that there's like a random creepy middle-aged man spraying juices around the house. You know what I mean? I mean, I would like that, but guests don't like that. Next. And then pest control, not really super expensive. I mean, I think we pay anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks every single month, something like that. So this one isn't gonna break the bank, but it is 100% worth whatever it is you have to pay. But it could cost you thousands if you aren't proactive in making sure that these critters aren't getting into your house during a guest stay. Okay, number four. We're on to the fourth Airbnb Avenger and that's your landscaper. Not too much here. This is a pretty basic job. They're gonna come mow your yard, pull weeds, trim, edge, all that good stuff. You're gonna need them pretty often. Every two weeks is pretty standard for most of my properties, but during the summer and during the spring when grass is growing really fast in Texas, for example, from watering and all that good stuff, you might need them to come out every single week because one of the things that Airbnb hosts often neglect is the curb appeal of their property, meaning a lot of Airbnb hosts focus on the interior of their home and making that super magical and special, and then oftentimes even their backyard, but they don't even touch the front yard, right? And so you don't ever want someone to pay a thousand or two thousand or three thousand dollars to stay at your property and then pull up in their vehicle and see a bunch of overgrown weeds or worse, dead grass, and then think, oh, did I get scammed? Did I get catfished? Is this property gonna be nice? You don't want anyone to ever think that. So a nice manicured cut yard is gonna be the number one thing you can do to make a guest feel super comfortable and at home the moment they pull up to your property. So just make sure whatever schedule you have is conducive to the season of your property. The other thing is, I know I call it a landscaper, right? The person that's cutting your yard, but they are effectively the keeper of your grounds, meaning you want them to do a little bit more than cut your grass. For example, my landscaper at my house, he does a little bit of everything. He just makes sure everything is pretty tidy. He'll move things around. He'll leaf blow everything. He'll trim hedges, bushes, trees, everything. And it's all just kind of part of his quote. So just make sure that whatever it is you're asking them to do, you ask them to do it at the very beginning. For example, I have a property in Austin, Texas, the Pink Pickle. I'm sure you've heard me talk about this one. That's got a pickleball court. So what I ask for my landscaper whenever they come out is to leaf blow and sweep the court so that a guest doesn't come up to a leafy court with a puddle of water on it, which can happen because that pickleball court is not perfectly level. But my system is, I ask both my cleaners and my landscapers to tag team this and make sure that that pickleball court is clean every single time that they leave the property. The cost of a landscaper is gonna depend quite a bit. Do you have a small yard? Do you have an acre? But for most homes in a neighborhood, typically you're looking at anywhere from 75 to call it 150 for service every single two weeks. For me personally in Houston, Texas, I pay 100 bucks every two weeks. But at my Tennessee property where the landscaper has to come and mow a giant yard that's typically this high, that can cost me 600 bucks. So it's gonna depend. Cost of your landscaper is very relative to the size of your lot. And that's your landscaper in a nutshell. Number five, your sexy pool guy slash your hot tub tech. I'm gonna lump these together because they go hand in hand. Sometimes you're the same person if you're lucky, but I wanna get into the frequency really fast. You pretty much need this every single week. This is not a once every two weeks type of job. This is something that you might actually need more than every two weeks. For example, when it comes to hot tubs, I have someone come out between every single turn to make sure that the hot tub is balanced and all of the chemicals are up to par and all that good stuff. There aren't really a lot of instances where you're gonna have someone come out every single two weeks. If you don't maintain your pool every single week, it's gonna start to turn green. And guess what amenity matters to most people whenever they book your property? Typically it's your pool or your hot tub. From an important standpoint, this to me is up there with the cleaner because when it comes down to it, people really do choose your property because of the hot tub. If your hot tub is broken, dirty, has a beer bottle in it or whatever, and you ruin that experience for the guests, they don't just want $50 back on their $1,000 reservation. They usually want $1,000 back. Hey, I booked your place specifically because of the pool and it is all green. What can you do for me? Now for me, I always try to fix the situation. This one is pretty unfixable when the guest is really mad that they have to wait a whole day for a pool tech to come in, balance everything, and then get that water looking blue. So please make sure that your sexy pool guy is coming to clean your pool as often as possible. One key thing you're gonna want here is you want them to be available for emergencies. Remember when I said that your guests are gonna be really finicky and if they book your property because of the pool, they expect things to be pristine? Well, I have a luxury property in Scottsdale. The nightly rate on that can be anywhere from one to $3,000 a night. When there's a single, a single leaf in the pool, guests will freak out.
And for whatever reason, these guests do not like being told to pick up the pool net and just take out like the single leaf that's in the pool and they demand that your pool cleaner comes out and does it themselves. Sure, they could clean it up in less than a minute, but they would rather wait four hours to have someone come out there just so that they can be mad about something and demand money back. And in those instances with those high maintenance guests, you need someone to come out on a moment's notice. Keep in mind, this will cost you. When I have any of my pool service people come out, they usually will charge me between 50 to 75 bucks. But it's a cost of doing business get used to it. It's something that you're gonna have to deal with if you want a pool or a hot tub. I know that I'm not selling you on a pool and a hot tub, but these two amenities specifically will make you a lot more money every single year. For example, there is a study out there that shows that having just a hot tub will increase your ADR, your average daily rate, up to $49 a night. So that over 100, 200, 250 nights can be pretty massive. So these amenities are money makers. You wanna make sure that you have the proper systems in place here. And then last thing here, similar to the pest control people, it will require some coordination. I'm sure there's an app that can help you coordinate it and automate it. Remember when I said handymen are good old boys that aren't super organized or technological? It's typically the same thing with the sexy pool guy. They usually just operate off of a phone. They don't have fancy CRMs, customer relationship managers or softwares or anything like that. So you will need to text them and let them know, hey, I know you typically come on a Tuesday. I have guests that day, but can you come the next day? This one is particularly sensitive, just like the pest control one. You don't want pest control guys walking by windows and looking in all that good stuff. Same thing with your pool guys, right? Pool is a very private place. So hot tub, people are in bikinis, speedos, trunks, all that good stuff. You don't want some random dude showing up when someone's in the pool because then they feel unsafe and uncomfortable. This is something that you absolutely have to coordinate. I actually didn't say this for landscapers because landscapers are very consistent. They come on a Saturday or on a Friday, whatever that day is. We don't typically coordinate that with guests. Occasionally, over my seven years of hosting, we've had a guest or two complain that the landscaper showed up. I'm talking like three times out of 10,000 stays. It happens very rarely, but they're typically not not going into sensitive places are usually on the front yard. Modify the landscaper with your own discretion, but overall my rule of thumb is you don't want your pool people to ever meet your guests. And the only time that's gonna happen is when they're there for emergencies because the guests complain about that single leaf in the pool. To be honest, it's pretty awkward for the pool guy, but hey, that's showbiz, baby. The final Avenger here is gonna be your photographer. Formerly, the photographer has never been one of my Airbnb Avengers, but I'm inducting them into the Rob Built Airbnb Avenger Hall of Fame. They're super important for capturing the essence of your Airbnb. And the reason I'm putting them in here is because every beginner host should be hiring a photographer. Most beginner hosts are trying to stay scrappy. They're trying to save money. They most of the time don't wanna pay for a professional photographer. And I just want to squeeze them. First of all, that's horrible. You have to hire a photographer. It will cost you thousands if you don't. It will make you thousands if you do. Okay, I'm not gonna get on my soapbox as to why photography is the number one thing that you should be spending money on because I'm just gonna get heated. Just take my word for it. Your camera phones, your potato phones, your Kodak 1990 film photography that you're trying to practice and you're trying to prove to the world that you got a design eye, it's not working. It never has. Maybe back in 2012 when Airbnb was a new thing, but in 20. 24, I understand the iPhones are nice and crispy. You want to take a nice, beautiful photo and you're like, oh, I'm going to put it on portrait mode. You put it on portrait mode? Oh, fantastic. Wrong. Hire a professional photographer. Next. Okay, just kidding. I'm fine. Photographers, you're going to want to hire them to come out at the very least to photograph your property whenever you launch it. To me, I actually think there's a use case in having your photographer coming out twice a year. One for the initial launch of your property, one to capture the seasonality of your property. Meaning if you're in a place like the Smoky Mountain, Mountains, half the year, it's nice, beautiful, and sunny. And then parts of the year, it's very snowy. And that's its own magical element that you want to capture professionally. What I see a lot of hosts doing is they'll take the professional photography and then they'll have their cleaner snap a photo of the snowy landscape during December and then post that into the Airbnb listing. And then it's grainy and it's bad. And then we're back to the cell phone photography that I told you not to do. And I also see hosts take professional photography and then they'll hang up string lights weeks after they launch the Airbnb because I told them to. And then instead of having the photographer come out and take a nighttime photo with the string lights on, they say, well, I'm not going to pay them 150 bucks again. I'm just going to take it with my cell phone. And yeah, sure, it's a little grainy, but it's vintage. You don't want to do that either, right? You want to have a photographer come out and always take photography at golden hour or at sunset. And if you can do it twice a year, you're going to be in super, super great shape. Capture seasonality. This is actually very important as well. I launched the pink pickle. I'm going to show the photos here. Truthfully, they're not the greatest photos. They were taken in the fall or in the winter when all the leaves were dead on my tree. They weren't taken at golden hour. And I need to have a photographer come out. I've been 
waiting for the trees to kind of bloom, be all good. And now my trees are all beautiful, green and lush. I need to have them come out and reshoot my photos at sunset so that these photos look significantly better. Now let's talk about the cost really fast. On the low end, you're looking at 150 bucks. That's pretty low. I probably would feel a little worried paying that amount. You're usually gonna pay between two to $500 for a really, really solid set of photos. Photographers do charge more to stay out until sunset, you know, twilight, blue hour, you know, when it's six to 9 p.m. That is typically gonna be charged to you at a premium. So let's say that they charge $500 for daytime shots. You want them to stay at golden hour. It might end up causing 600, 650. And then if you want drone photography, which I do think is super, super important, if it makes sense for your property, meaning you're on a ton of land, you've got an amazing view, you're in a really awesome natural environment, drone photography all day. If you're just a regular old house in a regular neighborhood, I would not spend the money on drone photography unless your backyard is super awesome, like this Funkit backyard that we just launched. Pickleball court, container pool, basketball court, volleyball, all that stuff should be captured on a drone. So it would make sense in that circumstance. And then oftentimes, just a little note here, not all photographers can do drone photography. So you might have to hire someone to come out separately to do that. Your photographer, two to 500 bucks is what I would expect, but they can get up to $1,000 a session too, which that one hurts. I know it's expensive, but I promise you this photo right here, my buddy Eric Barkhurst at Barkhurst Studios took this for me and it's an amazing shot. I uploaded it to my listing within 24 hours, made $18,000. I know I've said that on the channel before, but I say that over and over and over again to tell you that the ROI on photography is there. So you need someone that is really good at Airbnb photography and not just real estate photography. I know they seem very similar, but there are differences there. So make sure you're checking their portfolios and make sure that you're actually looking at their book of work when evaluating if you wanna hire them. And those are my Airbnb Avengers in a nutshell. There's so much more that I wanted to cover, like intermediate hires and advanced hires. But here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put my intermediate and advanced hires in that same PDF that I talked about at the beginning of this video. So you have it in one crunchy, snappy little PDF. I'll link it out in the description down below. And if you like this whiteboard series and how I run my Airbnb businesses, you should check out this video right here where I break down how to choose investable Airbnb market. Full of value, people said very nice things about it. So go click that after you click the like. Go over there, please. Okay, cut. Wait, wait, wait. All right, cut, cut. Wait, 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 cut. Okay, now you can cut. Yeah, yeah, okay, you're good, you're good.